Yes. So, hello, everybody. So, it's my, my great pleasure to welcome Professor Mark Timmy here. So, so Mark holds a, a professorship at TU Dresden for uh, network dynamics. And as I understood, this is closely related to the Institute of Theoretical Physics. And uh, yeah, so Mark is, is uh, working on uh, mathematical foundations of nonlinear dynamics in, in networks and complex systems. So a lot of overlap with the uh, um, topics we address here at the Institute. And um, yeah, so I guess the most thing he will, of course, explain by himself, uh, uh, what I just, just understood that, that there's a lot of applications for biological systems, mobility tracking or, or energy systems. And of course, uh, inverse problems are all over the place. So I'm excited to learn more about that. And uh, with that, um, stage it's yours, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. So please let, let me know if you hear me well and if you can see me. I'm the, the guy who is trapped like at every centimeter in the building. There is some, <laughs> some trap for me. Um, I hope I'll survive the talk um, despite the physical constraints. But I'm good at solving some certain inverse problems. So I hope it helps. Um, the content of today's talk had been announced to include leak detection, but I kicked that out because um, it's not uh, finished and I didn't want to share that by any electronic means. All the rest you see, you're, you're, I'm happy if you share it and discuss it. And we are also happy, I'm also happy to discuss items about leak, leak detection where we work on water supply networks and how to find leaks um, from, a, from a flow network perspective. The work I present today is, is in collaboration with several people, including Jose Caladigo, who is a former postdoc of us. He's now in Spain. Mohan Nitsan from Hebrew University, Hauke Hene, um, has been a student with my colleague Joachim Palmke in Oldenburg, and Georg Werner, who is sitting in the audience today. And the networks that surround you are essentially everywhere. Like if you think about your social contacts or about your brain, or about the content of your cells, or about how you got here today, it's all has to do with networks. Most of them are highly dynamic. And if you think about the question, what happens if one of these networks fails next week? then you, you see immediately that understanding the dynamics of these systems and to be able to maintain them or repair them or detect problems in them um, is a, a key open problem, uh, which for many of the applied systems is not solved sufficiently today. And we are considering these from a dynamic systems perspective. And what I, I call these, um, these items, uh, 4D networks, and these 4Ds I, I, I came across recently just because we discussed what kind of the main basic features of the system we are considering is, and it's actually 4D in the sense that it's not four-dimensional, but it's driven, like typically it's somehow externally driven, either it's kicked, or there's some influence, noise influence from the outside, or some other driving signals, for example, we are also, we are, um, one of our application areas is renewable energy systems, where fluctuations impinge, power fluctuations impinge on the power grid. They are distributed. They are consisting of discrete dynamical units. Most of the times we have some research areas where, where it's not only discrete. And um, they're always dynamical systems. And so originally it's inspired from biological problems, in particular in gene regulation, but also uh, related uh, to other fields is um, the, the research area of inverse problems, finding structure from dynamics, which is somehow the opposite of what um, the traditional approach is. Like you have, if, if you're a dynamical systems modeler, you have typically a model uh, of a system, you, and you ask what the collective dynamics of your network or system is as a function of the parameters entering your system. So, for example, you may look for bifurcations, or for, for the conditions for stability, for the for the for global properties such as a transient length or something like that, and as a function of parameters. And what I address today is the reverse: like ask what are the parameters 
to get to to obtain from what you observe, like from the dynamics you observe. There's a certain delay in transmission here, but I so I can manage. So uh, again, standard approach is you have you you consider systems dynamic as a forward problem. For example, you have a, we have a blue box, not a black box, and there's a system in there. You have a you have a model for the system, and then you ask what does the model do dynamically. So you can, for example, try to predict its dynamics, or you can try to forecast what kind of response it will have if you drive the system with a certain input, which is actually a very important field. Um, Non-equilibrium, non-equilibrium, nonlinear dynamics, trying to understand how a system responds is a common theme in, in decades of applied mass and uh, engineering in particular. And most of the engineering applications have been based traditionally on linear approaches, where then you might have feedback or not, and the, the questions about how the feedback um, or the control signal influences your responses. So you have a model of your system constituents with system elements, system parameters, structural um, features, and you want to predict dynamics. For example, fixed points, the existence of fixed points, stability of them, periodic orbits or whatever, chaotic motion, the response functions, bifurcations, and so on. Today, I'll, I'll focus on the reverse effect on how to obtain a model for a given system. Typically, you don't want or you don't need the full detail of a dynamic system model, at least not in the first step, but you want to, to have some certain features. Of model. And there are two ways essentially to get it. The first is if you, for example, are interested in a gene regulatory network, how to find a model for it, you look it up in the literature and you take it from someone else. That's one approach. And the second approach is you do it yourself. And in other words, you have data which are obtained from the dynamics of your system. And you want to understand what kind of features of my model do I know just based on these data and maybe some very general other constraints. And with Jose, we have written a rather mathematical uh, review uh, already 2014, where we got into uh, network reconstruction questions where which, can we tell who is interacting with whom just based on time series and certain different degrees on, of model assumption about model classes. So systems and inverse problems works in the different ways. You have the input, potentially, if there is one. And you observe the dynamics of the system. And it might be high dimensional. So you, the, the red curve is representing a, a changing multidimensional vector, which is typically also sampled in the experiment. And then you want to know the system model from it, or, or aspects of the system model. So observe system dynamics, deduce structural features. And if that is a network, it looks like this. That's a toy description of network, which has a certain number of nodes, and they are somehow interacting with other nodes. And, and for us, a node in the simplest case is just one or a few dynamical variables. And interaction means that um, in terms of differential equations, for example, ordinary differential equations, it means that one variable of one node uh, is influencing the rate of change of another variable. So what are the most essential features of such a network? And you can more or less see that from the picture. So you might argue that the first, that the first uh, most basic structural feature is uh, the connectivity, like who is connected to whom. But there's even a more fundamental property, which is the size, like how many units do we actually have? And so these are the two, arguably, fundamental uh, features where we have also worked on identifying them from the dynamics and what the first topic I'll start today was well row in one network size can you identify the number of nodes or the, or the very number of variables in a dynamical system from observing some of the variables um, repeatedly under certain different conditions and the second topic I'll come to later is okay, I'll come to later is to how to infer network topology, like who interacts with who. And although these are somewhat old 
um, references. We are still working on both of the topics, so it's actually ongoing research. Um, uh, Georgos in the audience has spent his master thesis on the first topic, and we have currently very recently made progress on the second um, in two directions. One is on spiking systems, which for mathematicians among us are hybrid dynamical systems, which are in between continuous and discrete time. So they are continuous time evolution interrupted by discrete time maps. Um, for example, suitable for a neural network, spike neural network descriptions and all kinds of technological um, technical um, applications. And um, I'll start with first part, network size. So finding network size from perceptible dynamics. And I really want, so consider this a toy model. I, I, I try to describe it on the, on the least complicated way. Though. So this really is the next 15 minutes or so will be designed like ex, as a lecture for introductory mathematics. If you, if you know what a matrix is and what the differential equation is, you should be able to follow. And most, many of you will have your own applications in mind already. So you have a dynamical system and we describe it by um, what we see. The only thing we see are a number of time series recorded from those variables which, which we can access. Typically, these are not all variables. We call the number of variables or the number of units uh, in our network small n. You can always do that in terms of network. If you're a graph series, you know. Um, um, addressing a certain number of variables and identifying with the number of nodes by just assigning nodes to the variable. So what we have here is, in the example, we have five uh, nodes which we can observe. We can observe them under different, for example, driving conditions. And for us, the driving condition is also super simple. We just kick the system. It's a, it's a black box. We kick our black box in a certain way. And do we observe the reaction? We kick it again, and we observe the reaction. We don't care about the details of the kick. What the sensory kick means for us is a different initial, um, creating a different initial condition. So the input is, is in our case, very simple. You just kick it in some random way. Um, we call the vector of all observed units y of t. In this case, it would be a five dimensional vector. Um, and x of t is the, vector, the state vector of the entire dynamical system. And so the question is, what is the dimensionality of x of t? Like how many components does x of t have? And we call it n, although we don't know n. So in our example later, we'll have something like 20 or so units observed or 25, and the actual n is at 100 or 50 or 200, something like that. So this idea, this idea is very simple and very basic. It's, it's based on the rank inequality in, in linear algebra, very basic one. So you collect the time series, oh, I can't point there, right? Uh, you collect the time series. Maybe you can do this here. Yeah. Yeah. Control C. Usually, then you get cursor. Do again. Oh, no, here. I have to point. Here's what you can point with the mouse. Ah. Ah. I can point with this mouse. Yeah. Look. So the first panel has like several trajectories of all the components um, as a function of time. So typically they are also simple. So they are discretized, right? You, in, in a real measurement, you can't measure infinitely many points, like not the full trajectory. You can only measure certain at certain time steps. But the, the main idea is here, you record under some initial condition or some driving force or after some kicking, and you, you kick it again, you wait until it converges to something which makes them, for example, indistinguishable or nothing changes, stationary state, and you kick it again and you observe again, and you kick it again and you observe again. And all these data, you imagine they are, they are discretized, so they are vectors, like finite size vectors, you put into a matrix. And for our basic systems, these are, will be five dimensional vectors under different initial conditions. So you collect uh, a number of five dimensional vectors in a specific way. I'll tell you how in a few minutes. And what, once you increase your collected data, the space of collected data, which is in, which we put into a matrix called T, detection matrix. So typically the rank of that matrix increases because you get more and more linearly independent observations. 
And at some point, it can't increase anymore because the dimension of the rank of the, of the observation matrix can't be larger than the dimension of states where you have. And that's all of the idea behind the next couple of slides. The rank will increase as long as you didn't reach the dimensionality of state space, and it stops increasing when you have reached it. So then you can, from that leveling off of the rank as a function of number of data points you have, um, up to a few technicalities, will be uh, the, the dimensionality of state, state space. So collect different trajectories, offset the of the state, suitably arrange those data into a fiction matrix, and suitably is a bit an understatement because it's not it's it's simple but it's not immediately straightforward it like, took us a while to arrange it in ways so we can actually use, use it and um, exploit the rank uh, that the rank is at most the number of the total number of variables in the system so that's all so if you if you're a well-educated mathematician i could you now just leave and you do the rest right if it's better Second semester student, I would just leave, and uh, professor, I could just leave and say, okay, that's a homework. <laughs> um, and because I'm not so mean, and I'm also trained as a mathematician and a physicist, I have this physicist uh, part of me um, who's actually teaching in theoretic physics, by the way. Yeah. I don't know. And, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm in theoretical physics because I teach all of my teaching in theoretical physics. So it's Okay, it's basically two uh, two sides. My left leg is doing physics teaching, and my right leg is doing research at the Center for Advancing Electronic Studies. And so it's more applied. Um, so the simplest setting: consider a linear, noiseless system, which relaxes towards one stable fixed point. Okay, so super basic. Nothing. Exactly. So, I mean, just, this was my, my question one one slide prior. So I, I mean, it's it's a homework. Um, as long as you can really clear distinguish between zero and non-zero, right? And I guess this is where you want to go yeah, now. There are lots, yeah. there are lots of, there are lots of, <coughs> small of them are small, and the largest one is unsolved, but no one has solved it. Not only us, it's just a computer. Okay. So consider a nonlinear dynamical system which has some fixed point which is stable, and I call it that star. You linearize about the six, the big point you call the variable x of t, which is again now, now my, my local state variable. Then you linearize, you get a matrix, and the matrix is evaluated at the, at the fixed point. And well, it has negative real part eigenvalues because the fixed point is uh, stable. And the main point here to, to remember is I don't know f, okay? I have no clue. I can't watch into my blue box. Can't look into it. I only see the observed variable. So because I don't know f, I also don't know a. But I can formally write it down. I can also formally write down the, the trajectory of the solution. X of t is exponential a t, which again is a matrix as well, multiplied by the initial vector. Okay. So far, the good problem is we don't know the right hand side. Nothing. Well, most of it also right hand side. We don't know the time evolution because we don't know a. And also, we don't observe most of X, so we have very little knowledge about the right hand side, but still, we can write it down. So, this was our bravest move just write down stuff which you can't know. It. And then we continue. We project out the observed time series, which is just the certain components of X, and we take them to be the first small n components. Like, for example, if you have five, so it would be the first five components of, of X. And then you write that down as a um, linear summation of weighted, time dependently weighted uh, initial conditions, xj of zero. And the theta ij of t is just, in this case, the matrix element of the matrix exponential e to the at and the element ij. And then I'll sum over that. So the main thing here is that the only thing we know is the left hand side y, yi of t. We don't know theta ij because we don't know the dynamics. And we don't know most of xj because we don't know the initial one, up to the few things we do measure. But please remember the formula in the box. It's a very linear, very simple linear equation. And that's the only base for the equation we need. Right? The only thing we need is that our equation has this form. As long as you can formulate your problem into this form, um, you're done. So note that theta ij of t is actually a nonlinear function 
um, of T, even. so and of well of A. So everything looks already complicated, but it's not. As I see. So the idea is now to observe M time series each for all of the perceptual components from the small n perceptual components, and the other ones are non-perceptible. In, in other words, we, are, we assume that all the, you, all the variables from n plus one to capital N we can't observe. And you sample those at, at uh, k time points. And for simplicity, we assume that these k time points are the same points for all the experiments. So for example, you observe it in one second uh, intervals or whatever. I think we can generalize that, but we didn't put too much effort to write it down because so much uh, uh, index schlacht in general. Okay. You, uh, that's what I said. Okay, so you have this equation. Now you collect you for the nth measurement, so you do, it, do your seventh measurement, you get one set of these equations. Okay, you will get a vector which I index upper n, which refers to the experiment y7 is is the seventh experiment vector we call it as a function of time. So every theta is a, is a matrix. And now you collect this for all the M measurements to get a matrix capital Y, which is just a collection of the factors Y, M. And you write it down again as a matrix equation. And not surprisingly, very, very basic. Now you do that. Now you do that. Evaluate the equation at all your sampling points. And again, the condition currently is that all the sampling points across the experiment are the same, meaning that the relative times are the same. Or in other words, you actually measure the same system. What you get is, and for, for technical reasons, we, we do this double transposition there, the, um, the detection matrix is what we get. Like this is the matrix T, and that contains exactly all the information we have, like all the data points we ever recorded. In all across all the experiment across all the k time steps is contained in the, in the detection matrix. And most of the right hand side, we have no clue of. Essentially, left hand side is known. The red box, the theta k, is not known completely because it, it encodes what the dynamics is. The only assumption so far is that somehow resulting from a linearization uh, near a stable fixed point, but Later, we'll get rid of that condition. We just need the fact that it's a linearization somewhere. <coughs> and uh, X0 is a matrix of initial conditions, most of which components you don't know because of the measure. So now we deduce the size from this matrix by exploiting the rank inequality. So we apply the rank operator, if you wish, to the first equation. And we know that for any kind of matrix, which is the product of two other matrices, that the rank of the product matrix is at most as large as the minimum rank of the two matrices, um, which, which are factors of the original matrix. It's just a linear algebra fact. So again, you can argue of, of which exactly, which things you know and how many dimensions do you need to measure. There are a few caveats which are in the paper, I won't talk about it, but you have to balance some of M and K in a certain way. But the, the catch here, the main idea is to in, you increase the number of trajectories you take into account with some condition on K. So again, you, you, you take a number of, say, 12 measurements, M, capital M equals 12. Then you exploit your, <coughs> you measure the rank of T. And now you increase M to 13. You again measure the rank of T. And you continue like that. And what you do is you get a ramp, a ramp up of the estimated uh, dimension of state sets, which increases all the time until it doesn't. And when it stops increasing, you met, you got the um, you got the dimensionality of state sets. That's now for the idealized case: no noise, linear system, stable relaxation, random perturbation, and so on. random perturbation to of the initial condition. And the minimum number of experiments you need is not surprising, is actually the number of variables in the system. We have done that for uh, linearized phase oscillator systems near the phase lock state. This is for experts at score motor model. And you get essentially the same with some noisy outliers here and there, but, but the basic message is the same. 
Now, the more interesting, oh, the, 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 the more interesting aspect comes in the on on the one hand side of the computation uh, side. So, the, uh, York actually spent all of his master series to explore how sensitive methods to actually get the rank are and how we can exploit that. Mm -hmm. If you are um, if you spend most of your time with mathematics uh, in the realm of linear algebra, you will not have noticed already that the number of variables you actually need to measure mathematically, if, if everything were, were perfect, like no numerics involved, you would need only one variable. In other words, you need to measure one node out of 10 million, and you would be able to reconstruct state space dimension from that. But practically, it's not working so, so far, so fine. Here, that was again for the stable fixed point. This is for a phase lock state. You see what we use is a, is a gap in um, uh, the singular value spectrum. And in, in, for these two choices, the system dimension is actually 100. And you see that the largest gap by far is at n equals 100. But that's not so clear in general if you have noise and heterogeneity and so on. I'm just ending um, this part of the talk by adding two more aspects. First is we go away from stable um, states, stable fixed point. Actually, we go away from stable fixed point, from fixed point at all. We just imagine there's some point in state space that star which but you know or assume there are lots of trajectories nearby. So you have sufficiently many data you can, you can uh, accumulate from nearby. So then you have, a, although it's not known anymore, but you can write down a, a flow and you can linearize that flow. And then instead of a single trajectory, you observe differences between two nearby trajectories and you call the quantity you measure delta Z. And then for delta Z, you get the same kind of equation. Get a linearization at a certain time offset um, of the flow. Note that you again you don't know phi t the flow, and uh, again also you don't know most of the, the components of delta z. But you get a, a similar equation which actually looks like the previous one, just with theta ij being this very abstract quantity, the deriv partial derivative of the flow at a time shifted point at a, evaluated at a state space point of your interest um, derivative with respect to zj the difference component you don't need to remember the details here what you need to remember is that you have no clue about the dynamics still you can linearize near some point and use all the information there no need for stability for example you could have chaotic motion or something like that and also no need for a, for a fixed point and we actually did that, evaluated that for Ritter oscillators, periodic motions. And you see, this is now, pl this is now plotting um, the estimated system size under the assumption that you have 1.5 times more measurements than the, than the actual system size. Of course, you can't know that in advance. But just to, for demonstration, it shows the left hand plot shows that you need about 50% or 60%, maybe of the nodes to be measured to be well certain or in uh, non varying anymore if you increase that um, and you can predict system size and for the right side again also about 50 or 60 percent and that's for chaotic dynamics before you ask real chaotic dynamics is three dimensional per node we ignored two variables for each node and also we measured we kicked only those and we also measured only those, so we expect to only go get those dimensions activated. So we didn't expect to construct a three n dimensional state space. And this is now a generalization to go away from this noiseless case to a noisy, heterogeneous, sparsely coupled network. So you, if you look very carefully in the left, upper left hand panel A, you see gray and dark and white spots, and they represent the coupling strengths among the, the nodes. Dark means uh, strong, gray means less strong, and white means absent. And on the right hand side, you see typical trajectories relative to each other uh, as a function of time relative to some uh, offset point. And again, you see 
then if you measure sufficiently, kind of see lower left, um, you get back your system dimension. You also see that if you increase the noise level, it gets worse. That's the lower right panel, but you can compensate for that by just including more data. Um, I'm not saying it works for all kinds of noise levels because at some point you lose your, your linearization and so on. But um, in principle, there is a compensation mechanism ongoing. Okay, second part. Um, this is now about finding the network structure as a function of recorded trajectories. And again, we have a nonlinear then the system, we write it as xi dot for x, each equation, each variable of the system, xi as a function of time, as the rate of change, which is given by some function fi of x. x is a full vector, but we don't know fi. So it's a nonlinear network dynamic system. And now we do not linearize at all. Still, we want to end up with a linear system of equation later, and, and there are a few steps in between to make that practically feasible. So we want to derive such a linear system, I'll show you in a minute, where you only have to find some certain coefficients C. And the coefficients encode then uh, who is interacting with who, which variables interacting uh, with a given variable Xi. You can also translate that to ask which of the components of the vector state space vector x actually enter fi of x, which are present. For example, is x7 influencing xi or x2 influencing xi? Yes or no? Then the, to find that c, it, it's a group sparse inference problem. And because we were, uh, we were having fun, in particular, uh, um, he developed a group sparse algorithm to actually get out group sparse solution in a reasonably effective way, which is not guaranteed to work always, but it does work in many reasonable cases. So again, the toy model for showing that it's independent of the type of interaction. So in physics, typical interactions are pairwise, like any type of mechanical system is pairwise interaction. And if you think of point cloud mass, points interacting with each other, for example, by gravity. So the total force enacted upon a given point is the sum of the pairwise forces. Uh, for oh, I should do that. Uh, for um, the first equation here, the first variable, there's a local term, h1 of x1, which gives me the dynamics of the local variable. Like it only depends on myself. And then there's this interaction term, it's called g13 of x1 and x3 which is the influence of x3 onto um, no, like variable one, but, but the influence depends somehow on the state x1 itself. So, but it's still a two-point interaction. The second one is x2, x1 is, is the influence of variable one onto variable two, again, dependent on the state x2. The third one is more interesting. It looks the same, but it's more interesting because it's the joint action of variable one and two onto the rate of change of, of three. So it's not a two-point interaction anymore, but it's a three-point interaction. And you could, in principle, go to higher point interactions, which are, uh, well, less and less, let's say, common in, in basic courses of, in, at least in natural science and engineering. But um, they are sometimes happening. And in particular, in biological systems, you, have, you often have effective three-point interactions. So we want to get rid of problems which arise from this distinction. And what we did is use or trans transfer the what's called incident matrix in graph theory to a dynamical systems problem. So incident matrix encodes which variables are influencing my given variable, or in other in graph theoretical terms, which nodes are connected towards my node in a direct fashion. So for example, the first line shows that the, the variable one and variable three are influencing the rate of change of variable one. But the last line shows that all three variables, three, two, one, two, and three, are influ influencing the rate of change of three. Now we do a slight adaptation of that incident matrix concept, which is suitable for dynamical systems. Instead of writing it as an incident matrix, we write each of the rows of the incident matrix as the diagonal entries of a, well, of a diagonal matrix, one for each i. So a given node i, for example, node one, would have 
a given uh, explicit dependency matrix, which we call lambda i, like lambda one, whose off-diagonal elements are zero, and the diagonal elements are zero except those where x j is appearing on the right-hand side. For example, the um, lambda one would have would be a diagonal matrix with one zero one on its diagonal. So we rewrite the unknown system F, capital F I of X is unknown, and we rewrite it as another unknown function, but now explicitly in containing this, this matrix lambda I, which, which kills those matrix, those vector elements, which do not influence my rate of change. In other words, if only, for example, for uh, variable one, X one, uh, variable two does not influence variable one, the rate of change of one directly. So the elements, uh, lambda i would be a diagonal matrix with, with entries one, zero, one. In other words, the, the effective function on the right hand side of xi would be a function of x1 and x3 only, but not of x2. So the matrix just does it, it just projects everything out and maps it to zero. So you just rewrite it by the completely formal rewrite with these kind of matrices, which are having the diagonal um, elements on the, uh, the, the incident matrix rows on the diagonal. And it, it has useful features for systems of differential equations. First of all, it multiplies the system states on the right-hand side of the differential equation. It explicitly appears only once, maybe as an argument here of the small fi uh, of whatever the status. And it's directly related to the incident metric in graph theory. So we somehow map the problem of finding interactions in my dynamical system to, to a graph theoretical problem, or if you wish, the other way around. Um, I skip you this one. Now you can do expansions. So Let's let's do the following. Let's expand the, the function fi of lambda i x in terms of orders of interactions. As I said, we have local terms. You may have local terms, which only depend on my local bias. And then we have pairwise interaction. Then you have, can have three-point interaction. And so on. let's consider the pairwise interaction. What you see is that um, each g, uh, g function is multiplied by a product of several entries of the diagonal elements. For example, if, uh, you, if node j equals 42 is not influencing the rate of change of xi, then the element of lambda i 42, 42, lambda i j j here, will be zero. If that is zero, you'll notice that all of the, all of the sums containing a j, like a 42, j equals 42, will be zero. So all of them will be set to zero automatically, although sometimes it's one power of lambda i j j, sometimes it's, it's one power multiplied by another entry, and sometimes it's higher uh, multiples of, of lambda components. So lambda i j j naturally multiplies each dependency in each order. And more importantly, and that's why we actually introduced it, it appears as a linear coefficient in the restricting equations, okay? So the catch here is we expand it, can systematically expand it, and, and what, not so surprising, but now the lambda does, the component of lambda appear as linear coefficients. So the problem now is because you don't know fi, we also don't know the g's, right? Because all is unknown. So what we do now is there are some basis functions. And we cut it off. Okay, we tell you, we, for example, you can take a Fourier approach or a polynomial approach or whatever you you, you like. I go to that uh, later. Assume you, you expand these Gs in basis function and you cut it off at some power or power, some order. We call these orders P1, P2, P3, and so on. Of course, they could also be heterogeneous. It's not important. The main thing here is that if once you know the basis functions, H, J, P, um, they are again multiplied by some coefficients which appear linearly in the, in the entire equation. 
So, and the blue boxes are now, if you summarize them, they are essentially linear coefficients. And all the rest you do know. You know the, the H, JPs, like the, the basis functions. If you record the state XJ or XJ and XS or at some certain time T, you also can evaluate the basis function, so you have a number. And if the, the sampling is sufficiently high and, and reliable, you could try to estimate the rate of change, xi of, of t. So you can also estimate the left-hand side. And this is what, what we did. So we arrived at an equation which looked like this. We have a vector, which is known, essentially the rate of change of, of the xi's. You have a, a coefficient matrix, which is unknown. And you have, again, a, a, a collection of known evaluations of all my basis functions. Now the problem is it's not there's no standard straightforward fast and reliable uh, process algorithm to actually find solutions for that because these solutions are neither fully like you, you wouldn't go for um, the least square solution and um, because that would typically result in fully occupied networks like here everyone is interacting with everyone in reality that's not happening what we know from biology and engineering everywhere we look. Um, so you could say you, go, you do sparse regression, but that's also not true because if you, as I explained before, if, if one lambda i j j is zero, the entire following sums, no matter what the sum of s and w, for example, is, they're all zero for this given j. So if j is 42, it doesn't matter what other terms are coming there, all of them are zero. So this is a block sparse solution. Either you have lots of non-zero entries typically, or you have rows of zero. So it looks like, not like the first row, but rather like the second row. You have a block sparse solution. Most of them is blank. There's nothing, it's zeros, lots of zeros. And then if it's not zero, there's typically a block of non-zero. So we want to find these types of solutions for C. And we did it with Ani. Who knows Ani? Who is Arnie? Do you know? <laughs> no. No, no. Too, too young. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, is here, the algorithm for revealing network interactions, okay? And as the as, uh, picture suggests, it's a bit of brute force. <laughs> but it does work well. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't explain the mathematical details here, but the idea is as follows. The governator, exactly. Yeah. The idea is as follows. You, you evaluate the right-hand side, assuming uh, that only one variable is influencing the rate of change of xi. And you ask which variable explains the rate of change best. In other words, I have my basis functions. I choose them in some way. I, I attempt to explain that with only one variable interacting, and I pick that and I keep it to my, to my box. It's like a greedy algorithm. Um, then I keep it and I, ask, I project out the contribution from that variable, and I ask in that subspace of other of the remaining solution which additional variable would explain most or uh, best the remaining uh, vector, projected out vector. And then it, it happens to be like the green node, and I put the green, and then I, I do the same again, again, again. It's until it's at some point, um, my my estimator is smaller than a certain uh, threshold. Of course, it's not clear what it means, but qualitatively, it, it is like this. Like, of course, there's always numerics involved, uh, in the sense that there is numerical errors, there's noise, there's also numerical inaccuracies, and the typical curve which we see are not a lot. Of I can do this again. The typical curve we see is a decaying arrow rap relatively rapidly, and then there's a knee, so the L-shaped. And, and of course, you can evaluate it for all L's, so you would actually see this. And the moment you see that, that the L becomes flat, you say, okay, this is maybe the, this is one above the actual number of, of interactions I have. And in the example here, which is um, a modified Kuramoto model with a phase shift here and a second harmonic over here and some weird coefficients. Um, there, were, there have been exactly 15 inputs for each node. And so for each node, and it, it came out that, well, the best estimate here is 15 from just 
visualizing it. Right? There's more technical stuff involved, but you could also look at it and say, okay, where does the L stop or I'll start flattening and then go one back? And that would be 50. And the actual is, is 50. Now, um, if you if you do anything with basis functions, you you have the right to ask why isn't that is, why are you modeling this this function? I mean, essentially, you need to know what kind of right hand side you have to pick the right functions. But uh, that's not true. The only thing we need to have is the, the right type of function, which actually contains the right number of interacting variables. For example. Um, what is shown here is the quality of reconstruction as a function of the type of basis function we choose with all other parameters fixed. The AUC score is the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. You don't need to know what it is, but you, I'll tell you that if it's 0 0.5, it's about guessing. You can equally well just draw your choices by not looking at the data. And one means perfect reconstruction. And what you see here is that for certain basis functions, B, C, and E, reconstruction is pretty good, whereas for A and D, it's very crappy. So it's not a universal tool you, you can use blindly, but you have to approach the problem from, from very basic uh, functions, basic basic functions, to get to more involved ones. If you look at A and C, A is just the, the function of uh, monomials, whereas D is a set of sines and cosines in the higher, um, the higher harmonics. What you notice if you take sines and cosines or the monomials, they only have one variable in them, okay? So they do not have two variable interactions. In other words, um, they do not suitably model the actual system, which is written uh, on the top in the top line, which has a two variable interaction. All the other ones do model that. Like the, the proper one is E, which is sine and cosine of the phase difference in their higher harmonics. An improper one would be B, which is just some polynomials in the differences of variables. But the common theme here is that they all have two variable interactions. So you need to have the right type of functions, but not a detailed correct function. Uh, applications. This is a Kirchhoffian clock model of Trosophila, which has uh, ten different variables, has time-dependent uh, time evolution, has certain nonlinear interaction terms. For example, uh, many of these quotient terms have the p variables, pi variables in the numerator and the denominator. So it's actually pretty nonlinear um, and cannot be written as polynomial, for example. And the interaction graph is shown on the right. In this case, of course, it's known, and we, we simulated it, and we tested our model on the simulated data with nonlinear coupling. And oops, what we found is the blue curve, like the area under the uh, operating curve. It's a function of m, the number of variables, uh, the number of experiments we use. And you see, okay, under realistic condition, like strongly nonlinear systems, and um, well, other complications you need, like of the order, say, 100 measurements, and then you, you level off at about 90 or 95 percent accuracy in terms of AUC score. Um, you could try other stuff like correlation or partial correlation or transfer entropy, and you get, well, you like essentially more than double your error away from one. Um, so that's a reasonable performance. It's not perfect, but it's good. Um, that's a glycolytic oscillator in yeast, it's a different system, but the catch here is that there are genuine three-point interactions and two-point interactions and nonlinear couplings uh, in the same system, all of them. And we try again, and that's a result, okay? So same message here. Third example is a bit more involved. You have 100 units, you have a certain fraction of unobserved units, R uh, of, sorry, of observed units, so you observe 40 of the 100 units in this case, and it's noise driven dynamics. So, a real a dismissive trajectory would look like the top right one. 
and a real observed trajectory would look like a sample of the lower, the, the middle right one. Okay, so what you actually observe is the middle right one, and you have to take those and still estimate like rates of change, although it's not smooth and so on. Um, and we don't observe 60% of the units. So the red units in the, in the cartoon are not observed and also not uh, attempted to be reconstructed. What we attempt to reconstruct is the interactions among the recorded units, taking the rest as somehow an unknown, random, whatever interest. And again, it's, it's not perfect, but it's like above 80%. And it's also far better than the other like standard methods, like correlation or whatever. Um, in particular, the standard methods in this case boil down to essentially a bit better than guessing. Okay, you, you didn't need to put much effort uh, in addition to get six. Okay, summary of first part is how to find network size from the nodes time series. You can also translate that with the number of variables or dimension of state space. The work has been first published in 2019, uh, work basically by Hauke Hen. And um, it was a black box approach finding properties of uh, the network structure, namely the number of variables, as a function of the time series you can observe. You suitably arrange those recorded observed time series in a detection matrix. And, and use the very basic ranking quality of linear algebra by sequentially considering increasing numbers of experiments, which we take into account in our evaluation and got um, a pretty robust estimate. One aspect is uh, numerical and regarding numerical positions and evaluating the rank. What is a good robust rank detection? How many perceived nodes are necessary? Mathematically, we know it's one, typically. Uh, what happens if you have multi-dimensional units and measure only a few of the components? Does it matter in some way? And, and we, we are on the way of finding that it actually does matter, although intuitively, mathematically, it shouldn't. Um, we can discuss it maybe after the talk if you're interested. Um, also, very important for practical applications is, so far, we record near one point, either a stable fixed point or any other point, but near one point of state space. Typically, if you have a complex system, you have exploring some part of state space and less other parts. You want to collect data from those parts your, your trajectories visit frequently. So not necessarily only near one point, and you want to somehow combine the information. And we are currently on the path of also combining that as work with Jose Casillego. Second part, um, we found how to formulate a genuinely nonlinear problem as a linear problem by using basis functions from an appropriate, later to be determined class of basis functions. It's not important that you actually pick the right one, so you don't need to know the model. Um, there, there's this notion of dynamic space, which I didn't actually introduce for the, the style I skipped, but it, it boils down to having considering that in an instead of n dimensional n plus one dimensional space where the rate of change is the additional axis and you view that as a uh, as your problem space and uh, well Jose developed Ani as a potential solution for block sparse or block dense uh, constraint equation linear equation what I didn't show you is that this also works for um event spaces, like if you have, for example, spiking neural networks, and you can only record the times at which a neuron emits uh, signals, you can use time differences to essentially go to the same approach, um, introduce your uh, detection matrix, and uh, yeah, take the same approach, and also works under reasonably mild condition. If the spike patterns are very, very heterogeneous, like for example, you have a 10 times higher frequent, rate of frequency of spike emission in one unit than you have in others, then it might have its problem. But it's a general problem of time scale separation. And we have worked, I have not shown you what if you only have the statistics of time series, which sometimes occur in uh, biological settings where you grab at certain time points. And you, but you don't know the time points because it's the ensemble of cells, which
which are in their evolution in a different state. So you, you don't really know, you only have statistics of time series and you can still detect uh, structural features such as the topology from the under certain conditions that work with monitor. With that, I'll uh, thank my team and also those who are not on the picture. We have to go for a hike again and take a big picture. <laughs> Um, uh, and you for your attention. Thanks for the invitation. I'm here the entire day. I think.